So welcome, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everybody uh, to the last of the 2020 C3 Collaborating for Health International Seminars. We've been uh, running these international seminars for uh, almost 10 years. And of course, until this year, we've been running them in our home base, um, offering a delicious healthy breakfast, but only able to reach people who were within uh, easy reach of our London office. So there have been great advantages in having to work in this virtual way. Um, the two advantages are it's easier for us to find the right speakers who don't have to be happening to come through London. Um, and it's easier for us to reach a large number of people from various places in the world. Um, and today is a really interesting event. Um, delighted that you're able to join us. C3 has been working for 10 years in the world of trying to prevent chronic disease, NCDs, as uh, the invitation says, and uh, as they're known. Um, those preventable diseases that are so influenced by the way we live. And a big part of that is the food and drink that we consume. So today's seminar is looking at some of the detail of how we consider our diet in various places in the world. And I'm really delighted that we have uh, Sabri Bromage and Walter Willett from Harvard Public Health speak to us today. Sabri was committed uh, excitingly for us to come to us in London in May and of course along with many other things was cancelled um, but now we're delighted not only to welcome him uh, but to welcome him with his colleague uh, Professor Willett. So over to you uh, Sabri there will be in the chat um, function the opportunity to make comments but most of all to ask some questions the time for questions at the end we will be recording uh, the seminar and it will be on our website and available to all participants. And uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Cancer Research UK and the Burdett Trust for Nursing who are helping us with these uh, seminars. So Sabri, over to you. And really, I'm really looking forward to hearing you. Thank you um, very much, Christine. Uh, can everybody see my, uh, my slides okay? Great. Um, so thank you, uh, Christine, for the very kind introduction. Um, and uh, good afternoon or good morning uh, to everybody in the UK and everybody else uh, tuning in from around the world. It's um, really a pleasure to join you all today uh, for this seminar to talk about diet quality um, and some of the recent research that Dr. Willett, uh, colleagues, and I have been conducting in this area. Um, so this will, this will be a, a 15 to 20 minute presentation, uh, followed by a short interview with Professor Willett and then a Q and A with the audience. Uh, before beginning, I just want to briefly acknowledge the funder for this uh, research that I'll be presenting, uh, which is FHI Solutions, recipient of a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant to support Intake Center for Dietary Assessment, uh, with whom we've been partnering closely in this project. I also uh, want to acknowledge an international team of almost 50 investigators and collaborators uh, who we've been working with for the past couple of years from Harvard School of Public Health, the National Institute of Public Health Mexico, uh, China Centers for Disease Control, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Disease, the Earth Institute at Columbia University, Otis Continental Institute of Public Health in Ethiopia and Intake Center for Dietary Assessment. So um, to give you some background, uh, last year, the Global Burden of Disease Study Group published an updated analysis quantifying the uh, collective contribution of different dietary imbalances to global morbidity and mortality. And they estimated that 22% of each standardized death around the world was attributable to poor diet, um, which is actually a greater fraction than any other category of risk factor that they, that they looked at. 
the attributable mortality rates were particularly high in North Africa and the Middle East, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and the Southeast Asia and Pacific regions. The most important individual con uh, contributors to these deaths were high sodium intake and low intake, low consumption of whole grains, fruit, nuts and seeds, vegetables, and omega-3 fatty acids. And most of these deaths were attributable to non-communicable disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, and also type two diabetes and certain cancers. At the same time, uh, chronic inadequacies of protein, energy, and a range of micronutrients remain uh, major contributors to nutritional stunting, which increases the risk of morbidity and mortality throughout life. Um, can also re result in permanent cognitive defects and contribute significant global losses in educational attainment and productivity. And significant national burdens of either stunting or anemia now coexist with overweight in seven out of eight countries. And a triple burden of stunting, anemia, and overweight coexists now in a quarter of countries, of which the economically and politically fragile ones are twice at risk of this triple burden. Global uh, dietary imbalances, they also influence planetary health. The um, Eat Lancet Commission has estimated impacts in 2010 and, and, 2000, and 2050 that different food production and consumption modalities have on different earth systems in which the impacts are expressed in relation to boundaries to the extent that uh, they're exceeded represent a degree of permanent damage to the environment. And in 2010 and projected to 2050, animal products uh, especially really appear to be a major driver of uh, many of these planetary impacts, especially in the area of greenhouse gas emissions. Staple foods are also important drivers, not, not on a per acreage basis, but because they're so heavily produced and consumed globally. So uh, one way to define a high quality diet is one that includes a sufficient diversity of foods to provide all the different nutrients that we need to maintain a healthy and an active life, while also limiting certain foods whose excessive consumption can lead to non-communicable disease. At the moment, we don't have a global standard metric that captures both of these two aspects. And this is because people around the world that eat very different things, they face different burdens of malnutrition um, and this makes it very difficult to propose a single universally applicable metric of diet quality. And as a result, the metrics that exist, they currently capture either nutrient adequacy or NCD risk, but not both. And they're often quite uh, population specific. Also scoring some of these diet quality metrics sometimes requires information on people's nutrient intakes, which is not always available, like food intake is. And some of the metrics, they involve somewhat simplistic or crude ways of scoring the amounts of different foods consumed. And this can render these metrics less predictive ultimately of, of health outcomes. Um, and without a standard uh, metric of diet quality, the global community can't systematically evaluate and compare diet quality within and between different populations. So in this project, we, uh, we sought to address this issue by developing a new a novel and easy to use metric um, meant to capture different aspects of diet quality that could be also adapted to different uh, diverse settings around the world. So the uh, metric that we've developed is called the Global Diet Quality Score or GDQS. And it's constructed using information on the daily consumption of 25 different food groups, which is uh, a modestly expanded list of food groups relative to most existing metrics the GDQS also uses a slightly more complex system than some metrics for scoring the consumed amounts of these 25 different food groups. These uh, key features allow the GDQS to account for a wide range of foods of nutritional importance in diets around the world and also capture the collective contribution of these different foods to both nutrient adequacy and NCD risk while avoiding the need for information on nutrient intakes which really facilitates the metrics data collection and analysis. To develop the GQS, we 
began with an existing food-based metric previously developed at our department called the Prime Diet Quality Score, which has been found to be inversely associated with aspects of both nutrient inadequacy and NCD risk in a few different low and high income settings. We first made an initial set of modifications to the PDQS food groups and the scoring approach so that the metric could better represent the breadth of foods consumed around the world, as well as updated epidemiologic evidence on the relationship between different foods and health. Next, we refined the metric through a detailed secondary analysis of international data from non-pregnant, non-lactating women of reproductive age in which we scored different candidate versions of the metrics using data from 24-hour diet recalls or food frequency questionnaires and determined associations between these recreated uh, metric scores in the data and different health and nutrition outcomes that were available for us for analysis. And we statistically compared the performance of different candidate metric versions, if you will, to inform incremental improvements. <clears throat> After identifying the GDQS as the best performing metric out of a set of 32 candidates, we also compared the GDQS against two existing metrics, the MDDW, which is a commonly used proxy for nutrient adequacy, and also the AHDI 2010, which was developed originally to capture diet-related chronic disease risk. The MDDW is quite simple to use. It's scored as the sum of the number of food groups out of 10 reported to be consumed in an appreciable quantity, um, resulting in a score from zero to 10. Uh, scoring the AHEI 2010 is a bit more complex. It requires quantitative information on the amount of consumption of six, six different food groups, as well as several uh, different nutrients, including fatty acids, sodium, and alcohol. <clears throat> So the, um, the data sets that we analyzed in this project included the, uh, the US Nurses Health Study 2 cohort, the 2012 and 2016 Mexican National Nutrition uh, Survey, uh, the Mexican Teachers Cohort, the first and third years of the Millennium Villages Project, which covers uh, 10 different African countries, um, a well-designed survey of diet and anemia etiology in Ethiopia, the 2010-2012 China National Nutrition and Health Survey, the Indian Migration Study, and the Andhra Pradesh Children and Parents Study. And the outcomes against which we evaluated uh, metric performance included intakes of different nutrients that we considered high priority, uh, particularly in low and middle income countries, um, anthropometric measures of underweight and overweight, including change in weight and waist circumference over time, and uh, different biochemical measurements and blood pressure, and also incident type two diabetes. <clears throat> so um, this is a list of the 25 different food groups that are included in the GDQS. Um, and each of these food groups is associated with a specific set of lower, moderate and higher consumption ranges that are expressed here in grams of food consumed per day. We identified these gram ranges as ones that produced what we considered to be a reasonably even spread or distribution of lower, moderate, and higher consumption categories of each food group across the different populations in the data sets that we analyzed in our project. Um, these consumption ranges are linked or associated with point values um, that we base partly on our initial review of the evidence on the relationship between different foods and health, as well as our comparative evaluation of the performance of different possible combinations of point values over the course of our secondary analysis. Um, the 16 healthy GDQS food groups uh, in the green here, um, they're given points for higher consumption. The seven unhealthy food groups are given points for lower consumption and two of the food groups, high fat dairy and red meat, we give uh, increasing points up until a specific uh, threshold after which points are revoked. And this is to recognize modest consumption of these foods as important to nutrient adequacy in some contexts, while uh, higher consumption as a potential risk factor for, for NCD risk. And in order to score the, the, the GDQS, 
we score each of these food groups individually based on the amount consumed. And then we sum the point values for all 25 food groups in order to obtain the total score. And that ranges from zero to 49. And this is an indicator of overall diet quality with respect to both nutrient adequacy and also NCD risk. <clears throat> we also um, developed and evaluated two submetrics, the GDQS positive and the GDQS negative. Um, and these are scored using only the healthy or the unhealthy GDQS food groups, respectively. In our secondary analysis, we found that the GDQS displayed modest to moderate uh, correlations with intake or consumption of calcium fiber, folate, iron protein, uh, vitamin A, and zinc in most of the data sets that we looked at. The GDQS also tended to correlate somewhat more strongly than the MDDW, uh, the simpler uh, food-based metric that I mentioned with intakes of seven of the 11 nutrients that we looked at, while the MDDW tended to correlate better with a few, a few nutrients, including calcium, saturated fat, vitamins A and B12. The GDQS uh, performed comparably, comparably well with the MDDW in predicting nutrient adequacy, uh, defined as intake in relation to specific reference cutoffs, except in one data set in Ethiopia, in which the MDDW um, did outperform. And the GDQS performed about as well as the MDDW in predicting underweight and low mid-upper arm circumference in Africa and, and Indian data sets. So um, the GDQS also performed about as well as the MDDW in predicting biochemical measures of nutrient adequacy. Um, on the left graph, uh, this shows the estimated mean hemoglobin concentrations by quintile of the GDQS and MDDW scores in Ethiopia and in 10 different African countries as part of the Millennium Village project. And in both of these data sets, we found no significant difference in the trends between the two metrics across the quintile of the scores, as you can see here. Um, on the right, we can see the mean serum folate within GDQS and MDDW quintiles in both Ethiopia and urban Mexico. And again, we didn't find significant differences in the metric performance in either of these data sets. Um, moving on to uh, non-communicable disease risk. These graphs show the odds ratio for metabolic syndrome within different quintiles of the GDQS. The GDQS positive submetric, which is scored using just the 16 healthy GDQS food groups and the alternative healthy eating index 2010, the AATI 2010, which as I discussed is scored using information on food intakes and also a few nutrients. Um, metabolic syndrome here is defined as having at least three out of five metabolic risk factors, including low HDL or good cholesterol and high waist circumference, blood pressure, triglycerides, and blood sugar. From the left graph here, you can see that both the GDQS and the GDQS positive submetrics significantly outperformed the AHEI 2010 in predicting lower odds of metabolic syndrome in urban China. While on the right, you can see that the uh, GDQS positive in particular outperformed the AHEI in 2010, uh, the AHEI 2010 in urban Mexico, while the GDQS performed about as well. <clears throat> we also evaluated the GDQS's associations with NCD outcomes in a longitudinal analysis of two prospective cohort studies. In analysis of the Mexican teachers cohort on the left, we found that a one standard deviation increase in the GDQS was more sensitive than a change in the AHEI 2010 or MDDW in capturing two year decreases in weight and also waist circumference, uh, not shown here. And in analysis of the US, US Nurses Health Study 2 cohort on the right, um, the GDQS performed almost as well as the AHEI 2010 in predicting risk of incident type two diabetes and also uh, weight change, not, not shown here. So um, overall, we found that the GDQS performed comparably well um, with the MDDW in predicting nutrient adequacy outcomes and generally as well or better than the AHEA 2010 um, in capturing 
uh, NCD risk. And on their own, um, neither the MDD or the XCA2010 were really intended to capture both nutrient adequacy and non-communicable disease risk. So the fact that this seems to be possible um, with a single metric is exciting, uh, particularly because the GDQS, it avoids the need for nutrient intake data to score it, unlike the AGI 2010. Um, the GDQS's flexibility in this regard seems to indicate perhaps that the um, uh, both unhealthy and unhealthy foods are important to consider when capturing both nutrient adequacy and NCD risk. Um, and just to mention that while the GDQS appears to be useful for quantifying overall diet quality, we, we propose that the GDQS positive and the GDQS submetrics primarily add value to the overall metric by allowing us to understand the contribution of healthy and unhealthy foods to overall diet quality in a given setting. Um, so at the moment, we're currently preparing to officially launch the metric, uh, the GDQS early next year. And our colleagues at Intake Center for Dietary Assessment are also developing now a, a novel app system designed to collect GDQS data that will also be um, pleased to present at the launch. And the next steps in this research involve um, work to extend the methodology we developed and tested in adults, uh, specifically non-pregnant, non-lactating women toward children and adolescents. And we're also looking forward to following the secondary analysis we've conducted with actual primary validation studies to examine the validity of a GDQS app or questionnaire in a uh, prospective fashion. <clears throat> so um, yeah, that was a very brief run through of the GDQS, um, a lot there and uh, kind of a crash course, but I, I hope it was informative. Um, I'm pleased now to turn to the principal investigator of this project, Professor Willett, um, for a brief, a brief interview on the subject. Uh, good morning, uh, or good afternoon, Walter. <laughs> it's, uh, good afternoon, uh, Sabri, and everyone, uh, wherever you may be. It's a pleasure to be part of this seminar. I um, prepared seven questions here. Um, some of them are inspired by feedback on the GQS that we've received already from a few different experts and stakeholders um, in which I'd like to get, to get your take on. Um, but first, a very general question, um, which really has implications for the future of the GQS and uh, perhaps global nutrition research in general. Um, the question is, what do, we, what do you consider to be major emerging uh, global threats to diet quality right now glo globally? And how are we doing as a community, a global community, to measure and address these emerging threats? Well, uh, thanks, Sabri. But uh, before answering those questions, uh, I did want to, for everybody's uh, appreciation, recognize that Sabri is really the person that has driven this effort over the past uh, two years. Uh, and it's been uh, great working with him and the whole team that he described across uh, many continents. <clears throat> the um, importance of dietary quality and having a metric became apparent a few years ago when I was on one of the committees developing the sustainable development goals. And we knew from all this research and Sabri summarized it very briefly that diet quality is tremendously important, uh, both in terms of undernutrition problems and non-communicable diseases. But we did because, because we did not have a metric that could be used Unfortunately, nutrition got very minimal attention in the sustainable development goals. I think anyone who's looked at that will sort of realize that, especially when it contributes uh, the latest estimate, 22% of uh, premature mortality. That's probably an underestimate for many reasons. Uh, but uh, basically lack of a metric, and this was uh, those goals were very metrically driven, uh, meant that we really should be having, uh, we should develop something that could be applied within countries and, and across countries. So we were very pleased that uh, the Gates Foundation and Intake uh, sent out an RFP to which we responded and were able to do the work that you've had. Notably, uh, the requirement was that we only use the existing data sets to do this work. Uh, so there's still a lot of research to be done and hopefully some people who are part of this seminar will be able to continue to look at this issue uh, the, uh, the performance 
of uh, what we've done and maybe fine tune it uh, as, uh, as we go forward. <clears throat> uh, but to be clear, the uh, metric in this work was aimed at describing population intakes, not individual intakes. Uh, although uh, it, the, the metric itself, the way of scoring diets can be used in both situations. If you're doing a cohort study, you, uh, collecting the data by FFQ would be uh, a food frequency questionnaire would usually be the way to go. If, but 24 hour recall, which was the focus here because we were uh, aimed, we were given guidance to focus on population intakes. Uh, the, the value of 24 hour recall is uh, you can use some open-ended methods in some situations. But specifically to your question, uh, diet quality is really far from optimal in almost all countries on a scale of 100 uh, in, as part of the Eat Lancet analysis. The average was somewhere in the around 50. The best countries were about 65 out of 100. So there's big gaps in the ideal and what is actually being consumed all around the world. It, in terms of the drivers of this, uh, poverty is very much part of it. Uh, uh, and more recently, marketing by international food companies of products that are uh, really detrimental to good health. You'll find Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola in almost every country around the world with very aggressive marketing behind it and lots of other foods that are uh, prepared with mostly refined starch, sugar, salt, sometimes until recently, uh, uh, lots of partially hydrogenated fats. So all those ingredients are very cheap and you can make lots of money uh, packaging them and selling them for what's uh, called a lot of added value. Uh, but poverty itself is, uh, especially in urban areas, uh, the sort of global industrial diet is largely refined starch, sugar, salt, and some uh, added fats, but often partially hydrogenized, even in, still in many countries. I'd like to say that lack of knowledge uh, as an educator is part of the, is a key problem, but the reality is that we need just more than education. Uh, and and uh, being lot, not being able to track, to follow, to quantify diet quality has really been, uh, again, a serious gap and we're hoping to fill that. Uh, a lot of attention is focused on obesity because it's so visible, easy to measure. Uh, and that's clearly a huge global issue, uh, but Poor diet quality is indeed one of the drivers of obesity uh, as well. And of course has indirect effects or direct effects independent of obesity. So this is a very big global issue. Thank you, Walter. Um, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned knowledge and educators. Um, you also mentioned um, clinical use or, or potential for this to be used in potentially an individualized assessment. Uh, well, you, you, as you mentioned, this was developed, the original intention was for population-based research, but um, when it comes to health professionals, um, and this is maybe of interest to, to C3 and the listeners um, who have done quite a lot of work with health professionals, particularly, particularly nurses um, in the UK and abroad, um, how, how could we apply the GQS for use in clini clinical settings or um, settings where we might want to, let's say, rapidly screen patients for diet quality? Right, uh, that's very important too. And again, I, I think we as investigators uh, have really not provided, not just the global public health community with a metric, but we've also not provided clinicians with the basic tools to integrate nutrition education into their practices. And the prime dietary quality score, which we developed with colleagues in Boston, as you mentioned about 20 years ago, was really intended to be able to give physicians a simple questionnaire. It's about, uh, that was about 15 items long as more or less a screen for diet quality, focusing on the aspects of diet for which we had good evidence that they were really importantly linked to uh, diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and uh, cardi other cardiovascular disease and cancer. Uh, so the prime dietary, that we have a little questionnaire, one page questionnaire that took about probably less than five minutes to, to fill out. Uh, at that time, there 
there was less interest in diet quality and not too much uptake of that. But just in the recent year or two, I think there's a, a more widespread realization that poor quality diets are a huge driver of the major diseases that are not just Western populations, but pretty much all countries around the world are feeling now. Diabetes, again, is, is epidemic in almost all countries at this point in time. So uh, this, uh, we, uh, again, uh, the use of the, this uh, uh, score, the uh, GDQS that's been developed um, is primarily focused on uh, population intake, uh, but the uh, prime dietary quality score is uh, that we originally developed is uh, framed as uh, frequency of intake for these different foods. And again, it doesn't require nutrient calculations. It's simple self-scoring. And part of the value of doing that is that uh, you can just look at the different items. If you have a patient in front of you and they're in the red category, we actually color coded the responses. It's, there's nothing uh, uh, hidden there. It's all transparent. If you land in the red, that's an area to start a conversation, perhaps a referral to a dietitian or other kind of counseling. Uh, so. Uh, we're working with a number of people now uh, who would, are keen to integrate this into their practice. Uh, it's, uh, I think, in almost every place around the world that I know, uh, modern medicine almost ignores the major determinant of health, which is uh, poor diet. Right. Um, moving back to um, sort of population level. Um, I, I have a question here that was inspired by feedback from Dr. Ana Campos um, from Boston College and now based in Mexico. Um, to begin tracking diet quality um, on a global scale, uh, which as you discussed is really kind of um, deficient at the moment. Um, ideally, we'd like the GDQS to be integrated widely as possible in different global monitoring and research systems and platforms around the world. And the question is um, broadly, how do you foresee this integration process over the coming years in terms of specific platforms to engage with um, what integration of the GDQS in these platforms might look like and how the GDQS might perhaps add value to those platforms? Right, I think it's important to keep in mind there are really two pieces here. One is collecting the primary data on dietary intake. And the second is scoring that data somehow to have a, a score like that covers diet quality, like the GDQS uh, that you described. Uh, the primary collection of data could be in multiple ways uh, in terms of monitoring, tracking populations, comparing populations around the world. Uh, if I had my choice, I think for that purpose, a 24 hour recall would be the best because it's open-ended uh, and it, it will collect the data on the foods that are consumed in that, pop, that specific population. Uh, of course, I think everyone is probably aware it's good to have at least on a subsample uh, more than one day, two days uh, of 24-hour recall so we can get the within-person var variability and assess the distribution within the population of, uh, uh, that's being studied in terms of foods or nutrients. Uh, so a uh, 24 hour recall would be the uh, ideal, I think. And from that, we can calculate then the GDQS score and then track that over time, compare countries. Uh, but if we look around the world, uh, I, it's shocking uh, that uh, many countries around the world don't have any systematic survey of what their populations are consuming. Uh, uh, that's not, uh, that's just all too, too uh, um, rare. Uh, a part of it is that that's expensive, but one way of collecting that data done uh, by um, uh, one of our former students, Selma Jasivic, uh, was something I've been wanting to do for a long time, but it's basically tacking this on or piggybacking this on uh, the national economic surveys because those are done in almost every country. Obviously, um, the economists control the budgets and they make sure they get their surveys done that we're at a disadvantage as nutritionists uh, from budgeting. But uh, she did this study. We reported it in the uh, Bulletin of the World Health Organization about a year ago. Uh, this was done in Bosnia. And with the cooperation of the survey 
group that does the national new economic surveys and they were very cooperative and very helpful because they realized it could expand the value of their data. Uh, and this wasn't done at the same time that the economic survey was done by, but the sampling frame was already there. And a year or so after the economic survey was done, we sampled people that were in already surveyed. So we didn't have to get a lot of the basic demographic data. We could link with all the data that was collected uh, and then uh, trained a subgroup of the original survey team to do uh, 24 hour recalls. Uh, so this was in a sample of about 800 people. And that does actually, it doesn't have to be a huge number. You really do get quite good population estimates and can slice it a couple of ways by gender and age, even with a sample of 800 or 1,000 people. So that whole project uh, was very economical. Uh, and depending on how you look at the budget, uh, 10 or $20,000 compared to many millions of dollars that are usually spent on national nutrition surveys. And uh, yeah, we got weight and we got blood pressure at the same time, which are two key risk factors as well. So there's, there are ways of collecting uh, the primary data very economically. Uh, but in addition to 24-hour recall, which uh, open-ended 24-hour recall, the, uh, the intake group and Sabri is working with them is developing a uh, simplified version that would be standalone, uh, essentially form of a simplified 24-hour recall uh, using cubes as portion size indicators uh, that can be applied even if someone doesn't have the other resources to do a, a more in-depth uh, traditional 24-hour recall and in places where they don't have food composition databases to link to the 24-hour recall. So there, there are several different options here. In fact, in the project that Sabri described, we did use uh, different forms of primary data, including food frequency questionnaires and existing 24-hour recalls. So there's, um, there's some questions appearing in the chat. Um, and maybe to give uh, Dr. Willett a breather um, and, and Sabri for a second, I'll ask um, perhaps take two, if Bill Jeffrey and then Rachel Crossley could unmute and ask their questions. Bill Jeffrey, are you okay to put your question? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Fine. We can indeed. Thank uh, you. I, I um, So the, the easy question, I suppose, is um, can you speculate about some of the public health uses of this uh, metric? And secondly, um, you know, the conclusions that you've made um, are you know, very consistent with the global burden of disease database that the major um, health risks of poor diet relate to insufficient uh, fruit and vegetable consumption, whole grains, nuts, um, and so forth, and, and too much salt. But there's a real chorus um, in the public health community, the World Health Organization, national uh, public health organizations, that we really have to be focused on um, fat, sugar, and salt. Uh, and sometimes they're defined more precisely, but I think it, I, I wonder if you think it gives a distorted uh, impression of what's really important. So two questions in one, uh, the simple one and the longer one. Rachel, can you ask your question that gives our, uh, our two uh, guests time to think through? Uh, Rachel, are you around there? Yes, yes, sure, thanks. Um, well, it was more um, responding to somebody else was asking, you know, how could this be used and um, I guess just disseminated and integrated with sustainability data. Um, and I just posted up there the food systems dashboard, uh, which a number of preeminent organizations are working to put together, but it's yeah, a, a big global database that brings together a whole range of um, data sets on a country level mostly um, on different elements of sustainability and nutrition and I could just see that the results of this type of national dietary quality uh, study could plug into that dashboard um, to provide um, you know yeah the, the the nutritional quality element overall um, so just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention in case they they didn't know about it thanks so um, which of you is going to 
kick off with the answer to um, Bill Jeffrey's question, which I really like because uh, I agree with his um, premise, but uh, he's more expert than I am and you're more expert than I am. So uh, some answers, please, to Bill Jeffrey's question. Maybe I'll comment first about the sh sugar or the fat, salt and sugar. That, and that's been unfortunate, uh, especially the fat part of it, because uh, we've known for at least 20, 25 years now that total fat in the diet is really not an issue uh, from a health standpoint, uh, but the type of fat is. And unfortunately, that kind of focus on total fat has driven people to eat more carbohydrates and often unhealthy carbohydrates. So uh, in many places now, trans fat, the worst is out of diets, uh, not in all places. And there's still some work to be done, but uh, I think uh, if you had to pick something that's really biggest, it probably is uh, carbohydrate quality, which is a lot of again, refined starch and, and sugar too. So that, that's a, that is a problem. And we've sort of had blinders on in terms of the refined starch issue. Uh, and then, of course, lack of the health-promoting aspects of diet, the fruits, vegetables, whole grains, uh, nuts, legumes. So I, I think uh, that, that it's good to have a message be simple, but it can be too simple and sometimes and also off target. It's really critical to be as on target as we can be scientifically. Uh, so that, I, I guess the comment about integrating this with other data uh, uh, around the world uh, is it would be really helpful. Uh, and that seems to be, again, this diet quality uh, has been the missing piece. Uh, there may be, uh, I think we should look at this critically. Uh, there may be other ways of framing this or using other metrics, but uh, this uh, we hope to put on the table and others can uh, take a careful look at it and hopefully integrate it, as was mentioned, into uh, the bigger picture of food systems as, as a whole. In the end, what people put in their mouth and eat is ultimately uh, critically important. And the whole food system should be moving toward that in a way that also takes into account environmental sustainability, which was mentioned. Um, and uh, that, that came up in a question too. Uh, that wasn't uh, part of our primary objective here, but it's quite apparent that everything we do does need to be looked at through the lens of environmental sustainability. And to the extent that the selection of foods uh, contribute to that, we, uh, this should pick that up pretty well. Uh, we come up with this diet quality score, but still the items that go into it uh, can be looked at individually as well. And clearly uh, diets that are high in red meat, uh, high in dairy are going to be the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, uh, so the, the, the big factors can be picked up uh, by this uh, 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 kind of data. The ways that those foods are produced is also important, and that gets into more complexity that uh, will not be captured by this alone. Sabri, did you have more to add in response? Um, uh, just one, one thing to mention um, in response to, uh, to Bill Jeffrey's question. Um, is that um, the the way that we've sort of designed the GQS does does lend itself to um, generating actionable data, as it were, for um, countries to use, and also potentially on a, on a clinical basis to to use easily, really, to as Walter mentioned, sort of identify what what parts of the system, the food system, or the diet are sort of def, def, uh, deficient, if you like, in terms of diet quality. So we have the sort of the positive, the positive submetric, the, the negative submetric. And in a, in a survey or, for example, in, in the app or um, data collection system that we've, that we've developed, it would be relatively easy to, to, to provide, let's say, an overall score and then provide the positive and the negative sort of overall contribution um, or or rather submetrics contribution to that overall score. So you could tell somebody or you could rank participants in a population um, relatively straightforwardly in terms of um, diet quality, but also in terms of what specifically needs to be improved, whether it's um, an, an increase in, in some healthy components or decrease in some un unhealthy components 
and things like that. Um, so that's that's one thing um, to mention. One other thing, um, as uh, as Walter mentioned, the 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 GD Coast was not specifically designed to capture sort of planetary planetary or, or environmental health in, impacts, but um, it, it it is apparent, and as, and as Walter mentioned, that um, there is there is some alignment between what we've created and and uh, for example the, the planetary guide guidelines, um, and it, it would be of interest and. Uh, and uh, our colleagues at Intake Center of Dietary Assessment have have suggested that a potential next step, something that would be interesting to look at, would be um, an, an exercise to actually see how uh, we could um, predict or perhaps how well the GDCOS was indeed associated with uh, different different kinds of um, uh, environmental sort of indicators, whether that's a carbon footprint or land use or something like that. So. Um, certainly an, an interesting next step that that we would hopefully explore um, quantitatively. We have uh, two questions in the chat that seem particularly to be uh, directed to Sabri and your presentation. Um, perhaps I can ask first Kotha Hajat and then Carol Levine to ask their question. Kotha, are you Oh, hi, Christine, and thanks, uh, Sabri and Walter. You have actually um, answered part of my question, which was on the sustainability issue. And um, I completely agree with what you're both saying. There's such a close alignment with the healthy aspects and sustainability and environmental impact. Um, but I think including that information could broaden its use somewhat. So particularly in um, high income countries, um, we did some work on behavior change and a large segment of the middle and higher income population respond quite well to um, messages about environmental impact more so than health impact. And so um, it seems like a, an added opportunity. Um, so thank you for, you, you've already answered that question. Um, but the other one was on um, the initial incorporation of processed meat and fried food. And I, I was just curious what your thinking was around that. Great. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's something that we, we did think um, hard about um, in terms of really the, the point values um, to give to different foods um, and also the, the sort of ranges of consumption with which to score them. Um, when it comes to um, individual foods, we, we tested really many different possible combinations. Um, they, they were ultimately based sort of on a priori criteria around what we think is, or what we can see from the evidence is unhealthy or, or not. Um, but the degree to which we differentiate point values or have, let's say, a gradation between um, the, the deleteriousness of, let's say, processed meats versus red meats. Um, was was something we we did account for in our analysis. So in an in an earlier stage, we looked at, for example, we, we did look at, for example, a, a score where processed meats were processed meats and a few other unhealthy foods were particularly um, deleterious and uh, more so than let's say red meat. Um, and over the course of our of our evaluation exercise, we eventually kind of smoothed out some of that gradation, both to keep things a little bit simpler. And also recognizing that some of the point values um, could could really ho hopefully be uh, more globally applicable if we if we reduce some of that um, sort of some of those sort of differences between between different food groups. So, in an effort to keep th to keep things simple, and also to to recognize that in in our analysis, we we actually didn't really see too many strong differences between a much more complex score. That, that had a, a wider gradation between, let's say, many uh, different um, deleterious food groups and a, and a simpler score. So where possible, we, we ended up simplifying things really based on what we could see in the, in the validation statistics. Um, so both a priori considerations and also really just trying to keep things as simple as we could without oversimplifying things such that the uh, predictiveness or the sensitivity of the metric was um, was really compromised. But uh, Walter may have 
more to, to add to that, perhaps with, uh, with respect to the specific food groups, um, five, deep fried foods or, or processed meat. <clears throat> right. Um, I just add a little bit that all of this, of course, is a compromise that if in our research projects, we will definitely be staying with our about 140 item uh, food semi-quantitative food frequency questionnaire. We've done lots of detailed validation on that. And if you really want to get down to uh, looking at foods or uh, food groups more specifically, we want that level of detail. So this uh, question, the GDQS and the assessment method that goes along with it is, is, is indeed a compromise. And it's, uh, it's almost always in real life a trade-off between having something that's uh, detailed and sophisticated enough to get at uh, questions and as much uh, fine resolution as we can versus simplicity. And so uh, the, I find it really quite surprising that with this simplification that we've done, uh, it still performs very closely uh, to our, and, and when we're looking at outcomes like uh, mortality or heart disease, quite uh, close to our much more detailed dietary assessment. So we think we haven't lost too much there, but uh, there, it, it's always uh, the curious person will want some more level of detail that we won't pick up this way. Thank you. And then uh, uh, Carol Levine. Um, yes, hi. Technical question. I Thank think you. On the yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I um, missed the beginning of this presentation. So, um, but my question was, I think um, Walter, and I may have misheard you. Um, I just wondered if you said it was $20,000 to collect 24 hour recall data from 800 in individuals or the application of, um, uh, yeah. So maybe you could just clarify that for me. Yeah, you may have heard, I said that with a little bit, uh, uh, hesitation because it partly depends on who's picking up what costs. And uh, with the, uh, the Economic Bureau in Bosnia did pick up some of the costs there, but the real cost, uh, and, and it'll be different in different countries with salaries, uh, of course, so it's, it's very rough, but it, uh, basically uh, two part-time uh, data collection people who don't have to be trained nutritionists, they were people who already uh, trained as data collectors by the uh, Economics Bureau because they had already done that work. So it took a, a, a couple weeks of uh, additional training. And then they worked part-time, uh, basically providing their own transportation to uh, homes uh, within the region of, of Bosnia. So uh, the, the cost of that, again, will depend on local salaries and uh, who's picking up uh, all of the costs of doing this. It, and you could figure in uh, a part-time supervisor for putting it all together, but still it's pretty modest uh, come when you compare it to the multi-million dollar uh, surveys, uh, health and nutrition surveys that are often done. And it, it, this can be spaced out. It, it really is ideally done on a continuous basis or near continuous basis. So you might even have just one person working on this uh, and you get the average over the interviews that they conduct over a couple of years. So it, it's rough, but quite modest if you just look at it in terms of person time. So I'm Thank going you. to and ask as, um, Ursula Ahrens to ask her question. And then we've got uh, two quite punchy questions to finish uh, the session was. Ursula, can you ask your question? And then I'll, yes. uh, great. A, ver a very quick question. Um, should some points be given specifically to fortified foods or the use of supplements? Although there might be a small part of people's diets, they can contribute very, very significantly to particular nutrients. And I think globally, there is wide use of fortification as a strategy to improve population diets. But I didn't notice fortification or supplementation use in, as one of the scores. Yeah, very good question. And that probably does need to be done on a country basis uh, as something added to what we've uh, already have here. This is basically uh, uh, if, uh, strictly food. Uh, if one wanted to get an intake of folic acid, which is a good one here, uh, it is interesting that just from the foods uh, uh, alone, 
uh, the, the association with the blood levels of folate was quite good. That's partly maybe a question of timing when the data were collected uh, and the fortification policies in those countries. And in the US now, we've just recently looked at this and uh, the fortified foods and supplements are, are the biggest determinants of blood folate level. So this is gonna change over time. And uh, I think one may want to have, if you're using this in a specific country, ask uh, separate questions about supplements. And if you're wanting specifically to look at folic acid, of course, there's a lot more to the benefits of fruits and vegetables than just the folic acid, but uh, you may want to uh, consider uh, the findings and if you're particularly concerned about folic acid in light of the fortification policies. So can I ask uh, Mark Cobain and then Tim Lang to ask their quite complex questions quite quickly. Um, oh, not Tim. <laughs> leave the final words uh, to our, our speakers. Mark, can you go first, followed by Tim? Hi there. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask the question about um, professional um, use of GDQS and whether we continue, so continue to focus just on sort of professional health professionals usage of these sorts of uh, scores or systems when in fact perhaps they might be more actionable at the point of purchase or consumption and so are there any thoughts about or what thoughts do you have around um, the distribution of GDQS in settings where you know, such foods are not available or using that as a tool to help people see the diversity of, or nutritional diversity within their own environment. Thanks, Mark. And, and Tim, not quite the final word to you, because uh, we'll uh, come back to our two speakers. But Tim. Well, I don't want to take any time. I've written it, actually. Indeed. Um, just, I was just making a point, as Walt knows, because we worked on Eat Lancet together. It's very hard with the criticism, persistent criticism, not just Eat Lancet, but this sort of work does. By the way, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you both very much. And Christine. Was, was that modes of production can have different impacts. And, uh, I, you know, the dream would be you have a sort of a, a, a range across the schools, I suppose, but it's just a comment really. But also that I was making a second comment, Christine, which is we mustn't in discussions about nutrition adequacy, just, just look in terms of carbon, the much trickier relationships with biodiversity, for example. Thank you. The final uh, the, words to our, our speakers. Yeah, well, thank, thanks, Tim, th th for adding that on. This is uh, very, uh, very complex topics, and we, I don't think we pretend to address all of them here. I sort of view the production methodology as almost another dimension yeah. uh, to this uh, that we didn't get into, but um, that absolutely needs to be looked at very seriously on, on a local basis. That's where the action, either local or national basis, uh, as, to, as to where that's happening. And uh, thank you for your reminder ab about that. Uh, carbon is, uh, there's huge urgency about that, but it really goes hand in hand with the biodiversity loss. I think both of these have very major non-reversible elements to them, which adds to the urgency of dealing with them. And a uh, good comment uh, from Mark about uh, also putting sort of power in the hands of other people other than the professionals, uh, that that is really important. Uh, uh, and we haven't, we didn't think about that too much uh, in that because it wasn't the aim uh, initially here. Uh, I think that's in some ways, this is sort of at the interface, what we were thinking about uh, at the interface of the healthcare system and the individual when purchasing specific foods, uh, uh, there the, pro the problem is that uh, one is making the choice food by food and uh, it's really the whole diet pattern is what we're getting at with this uh, GDQS score and, and the other diet quality scores as well. So uh, that, uh, it's something that people could easily uh, fill out this uh, the, the one page version uh, very originally from the prime diet quality score is something that anybody could fill out themselves and the feedback is there but it's helpful to have I think somebody work with them in terms of uh, uh, where are areas that are particularly important to emphasize uh, in their personal diets uh, and uh, and Tim's comment about 
thinking of sustainability at the same time. Does, uh, for some people, that's a primary driver. For other people, much less. But it's important to work that in as well. Clearly, there's a lot of work for all of us to, to take on these issues. This is one little baby step, hopefully, in, in part of that process. So Sabri, final word from you before. Um, well, I just, um, uh, I, th I think what Walter covered those two questions. Um, I, I don't have anything to add on that, but I, I did want to um, extend a very sincere thanks to, um, to, to C3, Christine, Elizabeth, and Tonya um, for, for putting this, this together. And I, I also uh, want to thank our, our listeners and, and just mention that um, we are putting together some publications at the moment um, describing all of this research. If, if anybody's interested, I encourage everybody to look out for this in the coming months. We'll be uh, preparing a supplement for the, the Journal of Nutrition, uh, which should be coming out um, next year in the sort of first half, uh, hopefully. <clears throat> Thank you. And thank you both very much uh, for coming for the presentation. I think it's a sign of uh, excellent speakers, the audience they, <laughs> they attract and the questions that get asked. We could clearly have gone on for longer, um, but the Europeans need their supper and the Americans have a day's work ahead of them. But uh, a very big thank you to both of you, uh, to all our participants for coming. This is our final seminar for this year, but we'll soon be announcing our program of seminars for 2021, continuing virtually, whatever happens to the dreaded virus, we, will, we believe this is a, a very good way of working. So we look forward to seeing uh, many of you next year at our seminars, if not before in some other way. Um, thank you both. Thank you all very much indeed. Goodbye. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.